Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, I guess the purpose of this stream is a few, uh, some time ago, a uh, YouTube user going by the moniker Ubuntu Linux was having a little bit of trouble, I think, with OpenStep on virtualization, right? And so I figured this would be interesting to look at. And in honor of Bill O'Reilly, we'll do it live. Um, we'll see how this goes. I have no experience with OpenStep whatsoever. So we shall see how it goes and go from there. So hopefully everything will work here. And hopefully my audio is also working. No way to really know that. Let me see on my second machine here. If... I'll probably get feedback like crazy. Okay, enough of a delay loop there that I think we're going to be good. So let's get started here. Uh, virtual box and create a new virtualized environment here for OpenStep 4.2. And we're definitely not DOS or other unknown. So this stream may in fact be a complete abject failure because I have no idea if this is actually going to work. I did read through a document and have assembled some files from the internet and we will see if this works. So we're going to do 120, so we chose other OS, just kind of get a vanilla thing. We're going to do 128 megs of memory. I think that sounds about right for a, a PC of the era. We'll create a hard drive and but we're going to put it on my SSD, my scratch SSD. And we'll do 2 gigs ought to be plenty. So I think we're going to need to tweak a few settings here. Um for what we're going to do. I do have my other machine up with the chat window. Um so I could be chatted to if need be. Um, I, I may be able to see that. Uh, let's tweak a couple settings here. We're definitely going to want the bridged adapter, and I guess we'll do the PC NetFast 3. Yeah, that sounds about right. Audio, called a Sound Blaster 16. Storage. We have some floppy disk images, so we're going to need to add a floppy controller and a floppy disk. Display. Let's give it a bunch of video memory just because we can. Um, what am I missing here? System. Uh, only one CPU. I think this should do it. Okay. Yeah, I forgot. I, I have other audio doing on my remote machine here, so we're going to turn off audio. We'll do null audio there. And I will switch into scale mode, so hopefully this will show up better. Because it looks like we're going to have some text stuff going on here. So let me go up into scale mode. I have no idea. How, see, I should have done this in, in Kimu. Um, we'll get back out of scale mode. And because we got to associate uh, some stuff here. So we're going to go over and pull in the CD and the boot floppy. So we want the user, I think, and let me get the boot floppy in here. Okay, now we are cooking with gas. Back into scale mode here. 
and I guess we will hit enter to boot. So, English, yes, I definitely want English. And we will prepare to install OpenStep. We will overwrite anything on the hard drive. And now we need drivers uh, back out of scale mode. See, this is where Kimu has the advantage. I got a message from I am the Unix nerd. Hello. Thank you. Uh, so I, I'm, I'll be checking chat every couple minutes. Uh, flip to the driver's disk. And then back to... Back to scale mode, and so I got to look for the EIDE um, dual controller here. That's IDE ATPI, but that's not the primary secondary. Yes, yeah, so we want five. And then do it again. for the primary secondary again. I'm going to want to continue without loading any additional drivers. Hey, we are booting! So it's nice they give some messages here. Um, again, as a reminder, I'm in scale mode. Yeah, I definitely want to install OpenStep. And I definitely want to erase the whole disk. Okay, so we got to make a file system. What's interesting is that unlike pretty much anything else, I mean, even things that are as bizarre as IRIX, which I guess would probably be the closest, I don't know, commercial Unix, I guess, in terms of use, right? So Next was for artsy types, right? And IRIX was for artsy types. Is that they don't say, hey, here's kind of a command line way of... of uh, configuring your drives, right? So it's very, 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 very simple here, at least so far. And that's what I gathered from the document I read on how to do this, um, is that it was relatively straightforward. Um, but it's interesting, and I myself have never used, or rarely, right? I think I sat in front of one a couple times, uh, Next Machines back in the, uh, in the 90s. Um, but, you know, as, as anyone who's, who knows my videos knows, I, I preferred, uh, Sun stuff and a failing that SGI, so uh, we'll see. Certainly not the not the quickest here. Let's see what our t overall overall list of file. Yeah, so we only have a you know less than a half gig of data here on the uh, on our install CD and then a couple floppy disks. So speaking of while this is installing a figure I can tell a little bit of a story. So the first exposure I had to Next Machines I was in you know just started college and of course first stop was the computer lab right so I was taking classes for uh, computer science um, and I had a unfortunately I think I had a spark station IPC personal and great display. I mean, it was a little out, I think only had like 16 or 32 megs of memory at that point. And I had a PC because I had to run Windows NT4 and Visual Studio to um, to do the coursework there. So I was checking out the computer lab, bunch of NT machines, not very interesting. There was also uh, a few next machines. I could never get a chance, like, no matter what time of the day, someone was always at one of the next machines. You know, the, the all black, you know, I think a monochrome display. So I'm noticing here is monochrome. But there was an entire room, which must have had, I don't know, at least a dozen Sun workstations with the gorgeous Sony monitors. You know, we had, we had Spark Station 20s, Spark Station 5s, a couple of 10s. Not a single person in there. So I got the, I had the whole place to myself and ended up doing a lot more work in there. Um, but a great environment. And I'm surprised that there were so few people using them. Like, why were the Next so popular? And and maybe someone can fill me in on what was there some specific application 
available for Next that was not available for Solaris, maybe. Um, you know, again, I don't know. haven't spent much time there. But we'll see how, uh, how we're going. Well, I guess while we're doing this, we'll take a look and review the settings here um, for our storage. So we're using IDE controller, um, one emulated drive, and one ISO on the IDE controller, and then our floppy disk controller with a, a floppy disk. 128 megs of memory. So nothing too fancy there. And things seem to be moving on uh, pretty quickly. But yeah, it's you know my understanding of Next is yeah it is mock it it says there and there are some window managers for generic Unix the environments that emulate kind of the look and feel. Um, but I don't know maybe someone in chat could could point out maybe was there some advantage to to Next? Um, I know it was a Steve Jobsism, and I have my own personal feelings about Apple, which, uh, which I will I will mainly keep to myself. It might leak out a little bit about my dislike of, of, uh, of Apple, but that goes all the way back to the '80s, where you know you had your choice of an Apple II or a Commodore 64. One was a lot better than the other, and cost a fraction of as much. Right, so the Commodore was by far the better machine in terms of capabilities, at least for things like games, audio, the the graphics certainly looks look better. And yet um, Apple could charge a lot more for the uh, for the Apple II, which was which was less capable in, in many ways. And the same thing happened For, uh, same thing happened with the, the Mac versus Amiga. Is Why didn't the Amiga win out? It had color, it had a full-size screen, real multitasking, Mac OS. Uh, hey, Anti, and uh, Ryan Risky in the chat has pointed out that uh, OpenStep was going to be a framework. Okay, well, that makes sense uh, if you did get that sort of cross-platform thing. And if they were doing that early in the 90s, that predates Java by a good a good ways, right? So that would have actually been a useful feature. Because um, that still isn't the case. I know you can get some stuff going with uh, with cross-platform. Again, the late 90s, early 2000s with things like Java applets. And you had some cross-platform stuff going on. And having written some Java apps, you can get stuff with, say, Swing for a GUI app that works everywhere. Obviously, the rest of the Java stuff largely works everywhere. So it'll be interesting uh, to see what, what Next looks like. So I haven't actually, what was that, 97 was the last time I saw a Next machine. But yeah, it sucks that Apple killed it. Um, they killed a lot of stuff. I guess, you know, Apple and Oracle are kind of my two least favorite... Uh, corporate entities in terms of the things they've destroyed in the world of computing. And uh, yeah, I'm just sitting here talking at this point because we are still installing. So it is not really speedy. I mean, this is on a you know, some AMD thing. Should be reasonably fast. We're running off an SSD uh, to do all this. So it's obviously doing a lot of a lot of checks. Um, trying to think what else would be may be interesting here in terms of other stuff to do. Um, probably going to be doing some stuff looking at some ancient Linux distributions. Um, I found some of the found someone has some of the distribution files for uh, MCC Linux out of uh, out of England um, appropriately uh, from I think the Manchester Computer Center. Uh, kind of a, a sad note here. So may take a look at that as well. Um, certainly leave a comment or a chat note if you think that might be interesting to look at some the kind of the state of Linux distributions in you know 93, 94 maybe. It's probably when MCC died out. And also if anyone knows where they could get a copy of the Tamu distribution, that would be that would be handy. 
and this really is installing a lot of uh, a lot of files here. So I, in my my research going up to this, I did see that uh, did see that uh, oh what yeah next or open step or next step was available for Spark. Might be interesting to take a look at that as well. Couldn't seem to find any distribution media for it. And yeah, so AIX AS four hundred. Um, that's interesting stuff, right? So I spent some time on AIX, worked at a supercomputed cluster, which is AIX, um, based with PowerPC. I don't know, I guess the P series. I know IBM's changed so much of the, so much of their marketing and labels for stuff. And AIX had some, you know, ranking in, in Unisys, obviously much more comfortable with Solaris. AIX is really strong, and some stuff came out of AIX that I really like, like JFS. So AIX is really pretty nice. Uh, the power architecture is really nice. Um, let me switch over here and pull out the floppy disk. And we're going to reboot. So that's restarting. But yeah, AIX is, is pretty cool. My only exposure to the AS400 with, the, I guess, what was it, OS400, worked at a kind of a, I guess, a warranty company. And they had one for, you know, kind of back office type stuff running DB2, I think. It was, uh, yeah, well, power power architecture is fantastic. What? I gotta put driver disks back in? Ooh, okay. It's bizarre. You think I already had it in there. It would have would have already picked up the drivers. Bizarre. Bizarre. But yeah, AIX is, if I recall from doing some AIX admin, they had a lot of admin tools. But it was never quite as straightforward as, as adminning Solaris. Um, but like I say, we had a, a supercomputing cluster. I'm trying to forget how many nodes. 6,428 nodes. So pretty decent uh, size cluster. Um, switch back to scale mode. Capture mouse. Ooh, the mouse is a little bit jumpy. So that may be a problem. Probably also doesn't help that I'm in, uh, in scale mode. Yeah. So hopefully we'll be able to tweak the display settings once we get in here. Um, there's, I guess, a patch that has uh, some additional drivers for VESA. So we, we have that if you see the, the patch ISO there in my terminal. And I guess we'll save anyway. So there's more installation. We don't need Swedish, Spanish, Italian, German, or French. We will continue along here with the uh, installation. So is it just me, or did I not say I didn't want French, and it's copying some stuff? Okay, we're 5% done. So this is actually quite a lengthy uh, install process, in that it's got, it's got a lot of stuff going on, right? So we did that first copy over, now we're doing another set of copies. At least we're already a tenth of the way through. So, you know, for, for being 450 megs on the, the drive, that does seem a little excessive. But, um, I don't know. I guess we're only about 20 minutes into this. So, the goal here is to see if we can get this up and running, get the video drivers working, and network working. I don't even know where to find any software for this. I guess you can, you know, 
compile some open source stuff, but I'm, I don't know the uh, the extent there. Uh, I notice a lot of me saying I don't know. This is new to me, so we are continuing on. I probably should have uh, not brought in the demonstrations and documentation, but I have a feeling we might need the documentation. So now I, I definitely would make a video about the AS400 if I could get my hands on one. Um, so I've got coming tomorrow, hopefully, at long last, hopefully I'll have a machine that I can run SmartOS on uh, for doing some stuff with SmartOS. So some off-lease, you know, i5 off eBay for 80 bucks, um, which hopefully will be good enough to, to play around with SmartOS, uh, which should be upcoming. But yeah, I've got... Uh, I'd love to have some of the, the IBM gear. Um, in my in my job, I deal with a lot of IBM software, but on the data warehousing, ETL, uh, big data, and analytics stuff, you know, BI and analytics and warehousing, and their whole stack from IBM. And they, had, you know, it's in, like any big software company. It's hit or miss. Some of the stuff's pretty cool, and others are not so much. Back to memories of the 90s in terms of the workstations. I don't know, maybe I can ask this question. People leave a comment or a chat message. What was the first Unix system you were exposed to? For me, it was uh, Sun Spark with Sun OS. What? No, no, it was Sun 3 with Sun OS. Was, was my first and that was well, a long time ago um, followed up by deck station I guess or vac station with Ultrix yeah I, I heard about the uh, the AIX PS2 I haven't I haven't tried it um, and I don't have um, I don't have an option to run virtual PC. Maybe I do. I, have, I do have a Windows machine. I could try that out on. Um, I wonder if it'll run under one of the really strict, uh, you know, actual cycle specific emulators like Box, or maybe even Kimu without KVM enabled. Might be worth a try. Uh, if you wouldn't mind, post a link to where, if, if you know where I can grab AIX PS2. I'd be interested to, uh, to give it a try. And I will have to check out uh, for Omni Group as well. Thank you. Um, so am I seeing that, did I see that correctly, that they're putting in what looks like Webster's Dictionary. Okay, and the cursors, up and down cursors, don't work. Ah, Xenix. Yeah. Yeah, a classic. Um, where did I first see? I think Xenix. There was a an Intel supercomputer called an IPSC2, IPSC, some hypercube architecture. Um, I think it was Intel 860 CPU thing, and it had a front end as a you know, like a 286 running Xenix. Um, but I, I never actually used it. But yeah, I, I think I may have to track down a copy of Xenix. Probably one of the few ancient Unices, other than maybe SCO, that people will get persnickety about you running without a license, but. But yeah, the, these old PC Unices, I, there was a, a television program on an archive.org has it called the Computer Chronicles, which is a great little time capsule to the, I guess from the kind of early to mid 80s, all the way through to the mid 90s, I guess. And they did, you know, do a few episodes. They, you know, co-hosted by Gary Kildall, at least for a while, of CPM fame. And just what 
they would touch on Unix and be like, hey, it's this complicated thing. And I guess for PC users at the time it was. But you know, saying, oh, it's it's user hostile, it's you know, it's confusing, we don't don't understand it. And maybe filtered through the modern lens where you'll see, okay, and even say 94, 95, installing Linux wasn't that onerous, right? Certainly things like Solaris, relatively painless if you're on Spark. SunOS was, again, relatively painless. And that that filtering of the, the user hostility um, that people in the 80s viewed uh, Unix as, just interesting to look back and see uh, what that was. But it's surprising that this show did even cover it. Okay, I'm switching back out of scale mode. And I'm going to pull the disks. And we'll restart. So it looks like we've successfully gotten it onto the drive here. And uh, that was what? We're 26 minutes? And a lot of that is just me remembering the uh, 80s and 90s uh, while the machine did all the work. I am surprised at how incredibly slow this is. Um, you know, we're running on a Xenix cache register. Sorry, just catching up with the with the chat. Yes, absolutely. I would accept hardware donations. Um, and I mean that's you know again depending on what it is. I don't want to don't want to duplicate uh, too much of what I got, but. Um, but yeah, and 90s Linux, if you had, yeah, older gear, I mean, it's the same way right now. The latest and greatest drivers might not be, be in there, um, right away, but you know, you're liable to get, uh, driver coverage. Yeah, in the 90s, if, what did I have? I think it was the CD drives, you know, sat off your sound card. You know, you, you're, you didn't have a CD-ROM interface necessarily, Weird MFM and RLL drives. Well, Solaris is a great place to start. Okay, WinWorld. Yeah, I will. I will check those out. Now, why is it telling me the floppy disk is unreadable? That doesn't make much sense. Let's see if I can put a. Can I create a blank? Floppy image. So create a blank image. Okay. Let's see, check that. Yeah, that's bizarre. It had no disk in it, and of course, the floppy is unreadable. Okay. Okay. So the next step is to um, eject the software drive. Oh, okay. Let me let me catch up on chat here really quick. So, yeah, deck station, especially if it's the personal deck station. So the the MIPS one, definitely cool because that was Ultrix three. So that would definitely be cool to play with. I have currently have. Um, you know the the Vax deck station, um, a couple of those. I guess those are technically Vax stations. Um, but yeah, the the personal deck station stuff is cool. Omni OS is I I don't know. It concerns me, right? Because Omni OS was really cool, and I just discovered it. You know, I'd run Triblix for a long time because that really suited me for as a development environment, as a development operating system. And yeah, it's really sad to hear about uh, about OmniOS because it was it had a lot of great features, right? Yeah, did I like IPS packaging? No, but they implemented it really well, and it had LX zones and KVM, which are a couple things that um, that Triblix didn't have, and you have in SmartOS. But SmartOS is really so much of a hypervisor. OmniOS works better general purpose server so 
it's kind of sad on OmniOS. Now, I'm hoping that the community will pick it up, but open source without funding, you know, can be tough, right? If people are really committed, it can work really, really well. If not, I don't know. So it remains to be seen what will happen with it. Um, but it reminds me of a quote from uh, The Right Stuff, which was, no bucks, no bucks, no buck Rogers, which is something to uh, I like to live by. Let me see if we can switch back into scale mode here. And let's get this. And we want to get a terminal open. Okay. Hey, we're in Seashell, so that is something. At least they're doing something right for the time. Uh, Seashell is pretty fantastic. So yeah, Triblix is Triblix is is great. It's probably my number one. for a development workstation. It would be my number one choice of a Lumos. Um, and for servers, if I didn't need to do KVM, you know, Kimu KVM and LX zones. So I didn't set a root password. So I'm assuming an SU should work, and it does. So we have. Okay. So we'll make a directory in temp. And we'll add this patch. And this patch is supposed to give us Y2K and a, uh, a VESA driver. Yeah, I know. I know. LX is is pretty pretty new, and uh, you know the LX zones are pretty new. But it would be great to see those moved in. Open Indiana. I don't know if I touched on it in my review. I played, you know, I've used it a little bit more on one of my laptops, and it has some pluses and minuses. Um, it just doesn't it doesn't suit me quite as much as, as Triblix. Um, can I copy and paste? Anyone know if... What does the right mouse button? I have no idea how to copy paste here. We'll type it out. So I'm assuming this is an X. Cool. So, so they might be... Might be doing LX zones for Triblex. Well, that's that would be a huge win, because I could live with using uh, like VirtualBox under Triblex to do virtualization as long as I had zones. Okay, so we got the patch extracted. Let me refer to my my document here. Sorry, I gotta pull up what OpenSteps equivalent of patch add is. Okay. So, the patch installer is not in the path. How bizarre. Okay. But it is a directory. Okay, looks like we're installing the patch here. Yep, Intel. So it, it looks like this patch will cover all the architectures. So, um, well, the patch management isn't too unpleasant. Installation's complete there. 
So why didn't that... We'll quit the packager. Uh, better safe than sorry. Tony Orlando method there. We'll reboot it. So that patch should have contained the VESA driver according to the, the documentation I have. And with the VESA driver we should be able to get out of whatever this is, 640 by 480 and um, get some color. And that weird floppy disk message again. I don't know what to make of that. Very bizarre. Okay. So we want... Should be able to go to admin. We'll try it through the GUI here. And configure. So display... Oh, the mouse is so jumpy. If I scroll down long enough, we should get a VESA. Yeah. We got VESA, and we also want network. So sweet, the AMD PC net is showing up. See if we can change the display mode on the fly, or do we need a reboot? Probably need a reboot. Uh, 8-bit color. No, let's do 16-bit. Uh, why the, the side menu keeps flipping screen? I don't know if that's a... Uh, Is that a feature that I'm just uh, such a small screen? I don't know. Okay. Can we get color on this reboot? That is the question. I'll switch out of scale mode in case that gets large, and we will see. So here's something that I think is interesting about this, is that they managed to wrap a Unix-like, I mean, this is, there's some bizarre stuff, you know, they put things in different places, but they've wrapped a, a Unix-like operating system in actually a relatively easy, I would think, for a the uninitiated uh, to use. And hey, we've got color, so now we just need to find out if we can get network. So I probably could have done uh, 1280, 1024, but I don't know. Is this uh, going to be big enough? Um, let me know in the uh, in the chat if you want me to go to 1280, 1024. But I think this is hopefully going to be big enough. Yeah, I didn't set a, uh, and again with the message about the floppy disk, there's no, there's no drive. Note the empty floppy indicator. I wonder if that's something about VirtualBox's, uh, floppy, um, controller. Okay, where are we at? What are we doing? Um, we want to set up networking. 
So back to configure. I will have to say though, again, for the, the RD type Unix, um, you know, I don't, I don't know about boot P or RARP. I would assume that's how they did it for, you know, net boots. I don't know if these things could even net boot. I remember what one of the next machines had that big magneto optical and had like a, a one gig magneto optical drive. Bizarre. Okay. I don't want configure. I want a simple network starter. We'll try that. And we'll go into my DHCP range. Give my router. Yeah. Okay, no. NIS. Domain. And yes, I know. I, I promised a video on NIS, um, which I'm still planning. Uh, things get busy, so okay. Connect the computer. Looks like we're are we connected. Got that nice spinning uh, spinning circle there, a la uh, Mac OS. So it's pretty obvious the uh, Mac OS heritage here. So let's see if we can do anything. Yeah, the one problem is I'm having is the mouse. Um, I may try... I may try this under Kimu later. Obviously not in this stream. We've already been going for three quarters of an hour. Um, but okay, so if config works and we are en zero, I didn't see any name server set up. So I wonder if it does use NIS. Um, Let's see, does man work? Okay. Let's see about manually entering this. Hey, DNS resolution works. Just had to edit um, resolve.conf, uh, which also means I should be able to telnet out. Okay, well, this is this looks like it's working. Uh, let me poke around here a little bit, see what apps it came with. There's a developer CD, but uh, this is going on a little bit. A little bit long. Um, preview, librarian, yeah, let's see. We do, in fact, looks like we get a dictionary. So I guess handy that they included a dictionary. Uh, do we have any demos? Okay, so we got kind of a boing ball from Amiga as breakout. Okay, well, I never thought I'd say this, but I'm actually game streaming. So, enough of that. Um, uh, 
Okay, I have no idea how to kill things here. I'll just put that in the background. Let's see if I can. Okay, so BSD style uh, PS. Uh, not too bad. Okay. And a drawing app here. Well, well pretty nifty. Um, little system. I, I'm trying to think what it's... I mean, I guess if you like this UI, and as mentioned, if you get the... Um, if you get the binary compatibility across multiple platforms, you know, the cross-platform compatibility, that would make a lot of sense. Um, not a huge fan of the UI. Um, but, you know, this was, I guess, competing against things like, you know, open look and motif. And I guess for people who aren't fans of open look and motif, this probably looks a lot better uh, and maybe easier to use. But you got some, you know, you got some dock action over here. Um, oh, something I saw fly by the screen, and I gotta see if this is this is legit, because this would would up its credibility in in my book if this was the case. But I think I saw Emacs go by. And yeah, we do have. Hey. I am back on the stream, so hopefully the stream is still streaming. Um, if anyone is still there and wonders what happened to why the stream died, um, I was exiting Emacs when the stream died. If uh, and Open Broadcast Studio has Control S as the start and stop streaming hotkey. So muscle memory in Emacs, I did a Control S and uh, obviously killed the uh, killed the stream. My apologies for that. So no more Emacs during live streaming or I've got to reset my uh, reset the uh, hotkeys in open broadcast studio uh, but the only thing you really missed was me griping that there's no compiler and the uh, and no uh, slash home right so they put the user in slash me and that's kind of where we're at um yeah i know vi right and i go back and forth on editors so much hey does this even have vi yeah so we got both emacs and vi Let's see what if i get a yeah Okay, so this is 97, is this version of, uh... Yeah, so my, my editor tree is, if it's very simple, I'll use VI. Typically Elvis, if I can get it. Um, if it's more complicated, I'll use Jed, which is kind of a, a lightweight Emacs that does cool stuff. Then full-blown GNU Emacs, if it's more complicated. And if it's even more complicated than that... It's got to be, you know, a real IDE, right? It becomes difficult to manage a project with, say, 15, 20 source files without a proper IDE. But uh, put a message in chat if there's anything else on this OpenStep system worth investigating. You know, obvious stuff like NIST isn't going to work right now. 
printing, mail. I mean, mail might, might work. Um, we're in, we're in the apps here, so it doesn't it doesn't give you a whole lot. So I'm gonna have to look and see if I can find um, find where other apps might be. Um. Huh. Interesting. Next time, like a television, and we can see what we can. Uh, can configure netware installer net info build a desk um, hmm let's, let's take a look at this can we mount NFS Yeah, I, yeah, no, at least no C compiler. I, I don't know if they, if they'd have an objective C compiler. There was another disk um, for the, uh, the developer, um, but unfortunately, I've got a, a whopping four minutes remaining um, before my time is up here. Um, I figure we'll see if we can uh, get. That's a good question. Um, which would be easier to learn, VI or Emacs? I learned on VI because was I over a I don't know, like a twenty four hundred baud modem. VI makes a lot more sense. I don't know. I would start with VI um, unless you're doing anything really complicated. If you just want to edit files, basically, so open, save, you know, create new files, um, you know, cut and paste text around line by line. So cut a line, paste a line, you know, pull lines back and forth into the buffer, and search and replace. Um, VI is a lot easier because you really just need to remember, like whatever that is, seven keys, and just hit escape all the time. Whereas Emacs, I mean, I, I don't know. I have a cheat sheet taped to the side of my monitor um, for a lot more of the obscure Emacsisms, right? Um, and Emacs, of course, you can extend fully. I know you can do that with Vim. Uh, as well. That's exports. Interesting. Well, let me see if I can mount. So no mount directory. We'll create mount. Okay, well, it doesn't seem to like modern NFS. Yeah, I'll, I'll take a look at Plan 9. I think that... Uh, that might be fun. Um, again, what what is what is Plan Nine like? I'm trying to remember. Never used it, but heard about it. And they take everything beyond the whole Unix. Everything is a file, except the things that aren't files. To the like, everything is an object and a self-reflective object, if I remember. So you can do object reflection across everything in your system. So Plan Nine might be really cool. Is it still being developed? I think I saw some some talk where. Plan 9 still has people working on it. I don't know. And I, I have no idea what Temple OS is. But yeah. I don't know. I, I hope none of my coworkers hear this 
hear this stream and me talking about the benefits of VI. But I think it's best to start on VI and always know your VI, because VI will be everywhere. And then once you know it, you can pick what editor um, you'd want for what task, right? So I'm doing some, having to do some work. Like I said, I don't know if anyone's kept up, but I, the company I work for got bought. So now I'm working for another company and they're having me do stuff. Only way into the, one of their cloud environments is through Windows and Citrix and then Putty into the cloud. Bizarre chain of stuff. And of course, not really any ability to add packages to the machines that I'm working on. So I'm using Jed is the best editor I could stand up really quickly. So, um, well, I will pull up Temple OS and uh, let me switch out of here. I, I think uh, I think we proved you can get OpenStep 4.2 open, up and running in VirtualBox pretty easy. <coughs> this tab I was open, I'm like, what is the capitalization for the stream description? Because I know Next was, you know, capitalized funny Sun OS. Temple OS. Oh, so this is one of those... Modern Commodore 64. Cool. Well, I am definitely going to have to take a look at this. Definitely. Well, let me let me hit hit a bookmark there. And uh, well, I the hours pretty much come to a close here. I've got uh, I've got to uh, say thank you to everyone who's been in the chat and, uh, and and typing at this and I know this was long took an hour we learned that open step is really really slow even on modern hardware and uh, thanks everyone and as always you know if you didn't think of something now leave a comment but thank you again uh, for all the ideas in here so we got Xenix AIX PS2 Plan 9 and Temple OS now on the list. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jot them down and uh, won't be using uh, Emacs for that. So thanks again, everyone. I will see you next time.